just last week at my old high school, the Air Sports Banquet, and uh, you know, just hanging out, reliving my youth, and we were there for four hours before the actual awards got done and we could eat, so who's the right idea was to eat first before the awards? Brilliant. It's gonna be nice, it's gonna be a long night. I know you guys wanna get your awards, so I'll try and be as quick and uh, precise as possible. Basically, what I want to do is, unlike other speakers, I'll get up here and tell you ambition, motivation, dedication. Oh, I will talk about motivation, but ambition, dedication. I want to make it more, more about you guys, make it more down to earth. So I'll be talking to you about the benefits of doing sport in elementary school, and high school, and university. What makes it special, aside from the obvious stuff of learning new sports and getting friends? What's special about doing sport in the level you guys are doing it now? Then, we'll watch the video of London 2012, for those of you who haven't seen it. It's a pretty exciting video. Who here actually watched that race live? Anyone? Alright, good. Three. So it's going to be you for everybody. It's going to be you for everybody. Um, well, after we've seen the video, I'll talk a little bit about what happened. We'll rehash it. I'll take you through what was going on in my mind and the teammates' minds before, during, and after the race. And then once that's done, I'll talk a bit about motivation. You have to touch on those cliche topics at least once. And then we'll, uh, there'll be room for questions if anybody wants any questions. So, to kind of reiterate the intro that Ken gave for me, I'm 26 years old and I've been doing track for Canada for the last 10 years. My first major international meet was when I was 16. But before that, you know, I did hockey, basketball, volleyball, track, soccer, in elementary school in Ottawa, just like you guys. Uh, I think when I was in grade five, one of my hormone teachers said, hey, Shay, why don't you try, uh, try out for a club, a track club, separate from school, and see how that works out. So I said, why not? And it started off as only Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and then four days a week, five days a week. And then the next thing I knew it, my coach was saying, uh, you want to compete for Canada at the World Youth Championships, which is the entire world competing in track, but you have to be under 18. So I did that, and then from that I did World Juniors, which is the same thing, but under 20. Pan American Juniors and the World University Games, where everybody is under 30, but you have to be university students. Commonwealth Games in India, that was great. Uh, a couple World Championships, which is you know, a big, big deal. Both the Jamaicans, the Americans, the it's like the real thing. And then thankfully, or luckily, fortunately, last year I made the Olympic team for Canada. And London was amazing. You know, what you see on TV at the Olympics is nothing, is nothing in comparison to what it's actually like being there. So I'll, I'll give you some little behind the scenes stuff that we shouldn't talk about when I get to London Park. But to the main issue, what is the benefit of doing sport in a high school or elementary school? You know? Yeah, you make friends, great friends. You, you get fit, you learn new, new skills. But I figured there's two things, like intangible, intangible things that make it good to do sports in high school. The first one is nurturing, the killer instincts, what I say. If there was a muscle inside of you somewhere that controlled how driven you were, that controlled how much you wanted to improve yourself and never really settle for mediocrity, you always want to be perfect, I want to get better, I want to get better, I can do this, I can do this. If there was a muscle that, that was somewhere in your body, doing sport in elementary school and high school would gradually work that muscle. I'll give you an example. Usain Bolt is a Jamaican, the fastest guy in the world, Olympic champ, world champ, world record holder. When he goes to a meet, they pay him $250,000 just to show up. And then he gets money for winning. You know, he is the definition of success when it comes to track and field. He's like a famous guy, makes millions of dollars. Every track athlete looks at him and says, if I want to be successful, I gotta be just like Usain. And he's, he's, he's done this for the last nine years. But even when he's done everything possible and there's nothing we can do, he still sits there and says, I want to keep on going. I want to win. I want to, I want to win more. I want to make sure that everybody else realizes that they can't beat me. I want to gap the competition. He actually said he wants to run 9.4 seconds, which has been like bio, biomechanically proven to be the limit of how fast we can run. He wants to pass that limit because he's driven. He's got that killer instinct that says, I gotta get better, I gotta get better, I gotta get better, and nothing, I can't settle for mediocrity. But on the other hand, his training partner, a guy called Johan Blake, also from Jamaica, lives in Kingston, He's number two guy. He's always second to both. He was second at the Olympics. He was second at the World Champs. He's always second in practice. People look at him and say, hey, that's that guy that was behind Bolt. Which isn't too bad, you know? I mean, if you can say that only one person in the entire world is better than you, 
And that guy is the best guy that's ever graced the earth. I and mean, that's, that's something to be proud about. But Blake, he's driven. He's got that killer instinct. When he lines up, you can see the whites in his eyes. And he says, oh, God, be bold. Be bold. Every race. He hasn't yet, but when he does, it's going to be it's gonna be because he has that killer instinct. And that starts where you guys are now, elementary school, high school. You know, you, you've been there, you've, you've been playing your basketball games and your curling matches and, and your track, and there's always that one school down, down the road that comes out and beats you, and you want to beat that school. That's that killer instinct. You want to be the most improved player or the most valuable player. You want to get better. You're like, I can do this, I can do this. That's that killer instinct that separates the successful athletes from the athletes that aren't so successful. Because the, the ones that aren't successful, they don't really have that drive to get better and better. So pat yourselves on the back, because everyone in this room is already doing it, right? You're all athletes. So that's one good thing about being in the position you are now. So tell your friends who don't do sports. Join the sports team, because it really, it really is a good thing and it helps you as I do sport as well. The second benefit for doing sport at the level you are is stress management. Um, when I played volleyball, I remember as our, our arch enemy, school down the road called Marymount, they came to us and uh, we were always going back and forth, they would leave home. This was a huge game for our school. Marymount came, we, the game started, they won the first set and they won the second set. We're down 2-0. If we lose the third set, the game's over. But we win the third set and we win the fourth set. No, it's 2-2, two -two, fifth set, points going back and forth, the crowd's going crazy. And you know, we're, we're on the court, and everyone on the court knows that if we make a mistake, if we serve out or into the net, or we mess up a bump and it goes flying, we've lost it for the entire team. That's a lot of stress on everybody in the court. It's a lot of pressure. But, you know, we, we cope with it. Because you've all been in that situation, whether it's basketball, you know, it's like 10 seconds to go, and you've got to take the winning shot. Or you're a soccer team, and it's down the penalty kicks, and you've got to make your penalty kick. That's stress. Those are stressful environments. But as athletes, Every one of you guys, you cope with it because you do it every day in practice, in your scrimmages and in your games. And believe it or not, there's some people out there that can't handle stress. My roommate actually texted me on the way here because she couldn't find her way to the FedEx to pick up a package and she was in tears because she was lost. Like, I don't know where it is. She can't handle stress, you know? But you guys can because you're athletes. You've done it through your scrimmages and you've done it through your games. And that, that skill is an important skill. It transfers over to you know, to work, to exams, like when you go to university, you're taking exams and you've got people sitting in the room and you say to yourself, this exam is going to dictate whether or not I can succeed in life. Some people say that's not true, but some people say that. That's a lot of stress, but you have ways of getting through it, whether you breathe or you imagine stuff. The coping mechanism really comes easily if you've done sport in elementary and high school. So again, pat yourselves on the back because that, that is a good thing. So you guys are, you're awesome, you know? Stress management, controlling yourself on top of nurturing that killer instinct are really important things that, that you guys uh, work on from this level. And it, it's, it really crosses over to becoming Olympians or professional athletes in the future. And on the topic of stress, London 2012, I was very, very stressed in that final. And to tell you in words exactly how stretched that was, or how that race sort of played out, wouldn't do justice to what exactly happened. Now, I'm sorry to the three people that have seen this, we're going to play the video now, so everyone else can catch up and uh, show you exactly what happened in London about a year ago. Second to last day at the Olympics. I'll tell you what happens. The Jamaicans win and they break the world record, and the Americans come in second and they break the world record. So don't look at those two teams. You want to focus on Team Canada here. It's behind those two teams, there's a massive dogfight for third place. There's four teams, or three teams, fighting for that, that one medal. So, as hard as it is, if you can only watch this video once, look at Team Canada and forget about the Americans and Jamaicans. <laughs> 
amaze everybody. You know, third fastest time in the world when we get a prime lane in the final, just right in the middle of the track. That's where you want to be. So after the first day, like where we run really fast, and the second we qualify for the final, we're hugging each other and we say, okay guys, this is great. We're in the final. We're gonna be we're like favorites for medals. Let's let's calm down. Let's not get too carry on catch too too carried away. So we go home and we sleep. The next morning we wake up. Now we have an entire 20-story apartment block for all of Team Canada. And the relay guys had their own apartment in that tower. All eight of us in that one apartment. It was terrible. But usually when, when I wake up in the morning around eight o'clock, it's there's movies going on and people are talking and people are shouting. I wake up at 8 a.m. on the day of the final. It's definitely quiet. You know, I, I'm like, what was going on? I, I look around and everyone's awake. But you know, so one guy's just sort of staring at the wall. <laughs> you know, it, it's 12 hours to the race and he's sort of staring at the wall. One guy's got his headphones on, listening to music. And the tension in that room, I, I, was, I was sort of wading through the tension. I'm like, oh, this is crazy. Because you know? <laughs> this is the Olympic final. So I have breakfast alone. It took me at least four hours to say one word because I didn't talk to anybody. But I had breakfast alone and I come back. And I'm just like everybody else, just watching movies, not really talking to anybody. Because we're nervous, we're stressed. Stress management helps, but it's a lot of games, right? You know, <laughs> it's, it's tough. So around noon, our coach, Glenn Ray Gilbert, he was on the same team that won gold back in 96 with Autumn Jaylee. He ran second leg, same leg as me. He's our coach now. He comes into the apartment and says, what are you guys doing? He's going to be fun. You guys are a team, you know, talk to each other, do something. I want you guys to go downstairs and have lunch together right now. So we all get up and we go down to the big dining hall and we have lunch together, but no one says anything, just quiet. We're just eating our food and thinking about the race that's gonna happen. So we go back, it's about four o'clock now, we get dressed and we take the bus to the track. Now at the Olympics, there's a mas the massive track, the main track you guys saw, and next to it is another track, a lot smaller, where people warm up. It's right next to that same track. So we get there three hours before our race and we warm up. We see the massage, we see the car, we do all that stuff. And then about 45 minutes before the race, you hear on the intercom, last call, of all the four by one hundred meter runners, please report to call room number one. So now it's like we're going to war. Everyone's like hugging us and saying, you guys can do it, you know, I can and there's fear on their eyes they're looking at us. I trust you, I think you can do it. So we hug we hug the therapists, we hug the coaches, and we start walking towards the tunnel that takes us down onto the main stadium. And it's just four of us now. The alternates have left us, and the other coaches have left us, and it's just four of us plus the right head coach. And when we get to the threshold, he says, there's nothing more I can tell you guys. You, know, you guys are you're in the Olympic final in the four by 100 meters. The entire world is watching. Just get out there and run like hell. <laughs> so we go into the first call room, call room number one. Jamaicans are there, the Americans are there, Trinidad and Tobago, the Japanese are all sitting there. Every team has their own corner in this big tent. So we sit in the Canadian corner, and the officials come, and they open our bags and make sure we have no cell phones or wallets or anything in the bag. And I'm sitting down there, sort of rocking, focusing, visualizing about my race. And then all of a sudden, in the corner of the room, I hear, Woo! <laughs> <laughs> and Justin Gavin, an American, is slapping his legs and slamming the, the, the wall or the side of the tent, and he's going crazy. He's like, let's go! Let's go! And then uh, Usain Bolt, who sees that, he's like, I'm not gonna be out there. He starts saying, Let's go, Jamaica, come on, let's get out there, win this thing, new world record. And like, the Jamaicans are saying something in Pachwa, and then Japanese guys start yelling something in Japanese, but I have no idea what they're saying. <laughs> they're all getting riled up. But Team Canada, focus. No yelling, we're all focused, we're all focused. So the officials come around and say, Okay, everybody stand up, we're gonna take you to call room number two. So we get a line, we go deeper. Under the, under the stadium, like in the tunnels. And above us, there's a race going on. 10,000 meters. I think a UK guy won that race, and it's in the UK, so everyone's going crazy. The, the fans are going absolutely crazy, and you can feel the noise in your gut under the stadium. There's dust coming off the walls. And I'm thinking, this is like gladiator. You know, like, <laughs> I'm Russell. <laughs> so we walk to call number two, and we get our spikes on, we take our shoes off, and we do a few last minute runs. It's still underground. And now we put our hip numbers on and our bibs, and there's more yelling. Jamaicans are yelling more, and there's just there's a lot of noise, a lot of tension. Again, a lot of stress. But I'm still breathing through it and thinking about those days in high school where I played that volleyball game. Like, if I can handle that, I can handle it. That's what I'm thinking. So finally, the officials say, okay, guys, I want the first leg runners here, second, third, and fourth over here. We get separated now. So now I don't have my teammates anymore, and we're in a completely different tunnel 
I'm completely alone. Now, anyone I know, there's people are raising heads. I come up out of the stadium, and I see the stadium. 80,000 people, cameras, noise. The interviewer, the guy, the announcer, he was, he was saying, okay, ladies and gentlemen, we see the guys coming out now, the last event of the Olympic session, the four by 100 meters, look at Usain Bolt, and it was going crazy, and the lights are going, the flashes are going off, and my heart's going, dish, 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 dish. I'm just breathing, just breathing. As I'm on the threshold, people are yelling down at us, saying, we love you, America, we love you, Jamaica. No one said we love you, Canada, but <laughs> I knew my mom was out there somewhere. So I walked. To my, uh, to my zone. I'm the second leg runner. I put my tape down, which is a mark. I'll get that later. But I put my tape down, and I just look up, look at all, look at all the people, and I breathe and say, this is, this is it. You know, I should just look around and, and really take it in, because this is probably the best day of my life to this point. So they blow the whistle, and they say, okay, on your marks. This alien goes dead to the core. And I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there looking back at the start. I'm looking at Gabby. The first leg guy is called Gabby. And they say, on your marks, set. And I'm in a crouch position, looking back. And then bang, the gun goes up. And for a split second, I can't see Gabby. Because they changed our uniforms this year. Usually it's just white, white, and red. Now it's black. You know, I had black and red. And for a split second, I'm like, oh my god, I can't see Gabby. I can't see Gabby. What's going to happen? And I see Gabby. And he's coming in, he's got the stick in his hand, and he's moving. You know, his head's going back and forth. Like, oh, Gabby's moving fast. I look at Gavin, and I look at my tape, because we put a piece of tape on the ground, which is your mark of when you're supposed to start running. If I leave before Gavin's hit that mark, he's not going to catch me. I left early. But if I leave after, he's going to run into me. It's going to be a terrible pass, probably going to drop the time. So it's going to be pinpoint perfection. More pressure, more stress. So I'm looking at Gavin, I'm looking at the tape. Gavin, tape, Gavin, tape. Like, don't go early, don't go early. He has the tape, and I leave on time, thankfully. And I'm running. And I'm running, and I hear Gavin say, hi, because that's what Canada says as uh, a command to put your hand back. Every country has a different thing. The Brits say, hund, and the Americans say, stick, we say, hi. So I put my hand back, and I get the baton, and I'm running, and I'm running. And all of a sudden, I hear the Japanese guy to my left. I'm like, no, not today. <laughs> so I pick up my knees up, and I'm heading straight to Jared. And Jared's looking back, and I see him with his tape on the ground, and I hit the tape, and he goes, I say, hi, I give him a stick. Two perfect passes. And Jared's going, like, yes, go, Jared, go! And my throat's dry, my throat's all itchy. I'm on my knees looking at the big screen now, because Jared's giving us a to Justin, the last night runner. And it's like a massive pack of guys running in third place. We're in fifth place. And then Justin goes to fourth place. And then Justin goes to third place. And I'm saying, no, no, I can't handle this. And then he crosses the line, and we get bronze. And I'm freaking out. I'm screaming. I've got tears of joy in my eye as I'm running to the finish line. And I jump in, uh, Jared, as you saw. And then Gavin and Jocelyn come. We have this big huddle. And we say, this is amazing. We're yelling. And there's people throwing Canadian flags at us. And our coaches are there. And I'm just hugging and kissing absolute strangers. And it's 10 minutes of pure joy. Because we realize that the Americans broke the world record. The Jamaicans broke the world record. And the Americans broke that old world record, too. So this is the fastest race of all time. There's never been a faster race than this. And Team Canada, which is ranked 12th, has beaten the entire world, bar the two juggernauts, which is, which is a great achievement for us right now. And we're going to be on the podium with the fastest guy in the world, the second fastest, the fourth and fifth fastest people of all time. Team Canada's going to be on that podium, and we're so happy. This is our childhood dreams. This is the best day of our lives. And I've got the flag, and I'm like, yes! You know, we're going to be rich, too! You know, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> So Justin said, look, let's do the victory lap. We start doing the victory lap. And then all of a sudden I hear somebody swear. I look up, I'm like, what's going on? And then somebody else said, somebody got DQ. And I said, who cares? We're bronze medalists. <laughs> but I look at the screen, and it says Canada DQ for disqualified. And at first I'm like, okay, maybe it's a mistake, maybe it's a typo, maybe it's a joke. But then it, it dawns on me. We've been disqualified. And then Jared comes up and says, guys, it was me. I'm sorry. What Jared did, the third leg runner, as he was coming around the corner, he took one step on the inside lane line, the white line. He didn't go to the next lane, but he took one step with his left leg on that line. Just that one step. It literally was five millimeters too much to the left. And that one step cost us an Olympic medal. Because when you have an Olympic medal, you're an Olympic medal forever. I'd be 90 years old, and I would have been Chase Smith, 
the Olympic medalist and the fastest race of all time. But at that moment, I realized that's all gone now. So I'm looking up at the board, and that's when you saw me there. And this is absolutely complete. All that happiness, all that joy is just sort of draining out of me. And I realized we're just all going to be forgotten in a couple of years. And it's going to be a little asterisk. Team Canada, DQ. So that's what happened. Now, even though we've been DQ'd, and I've been doing this for 10 years, those 10 minutes where we thought that we were Olympic medalists make all those 10 years of waking up early, going to bed early, not going out with your friends, not eating pizza. All those times that you as athletes think, oh man, why am I doing this sport? This, is, this sucks. My friends are either having fun, why am I doing this? It's all worth it. Because for those 10 minutes, I couldn't remember all those times that I was complaining. It all seemed like it was just something, it was, it was, it was the easiest thing I could have done to get to this point. So my advice for you guys, if you ever feel like, oh man, this, this is a really tough sport, or I don't like this sport because I'm feeling but lazy right now, this hurts. I'm telling you, if you really want to become an Olympic medalist or whatever it is you want, those sacrifices you make are totally, totally worth it. Because those 10 minutes, I will never forget those 10 minutes, even though I don't like watching the video, because I remember what, what it tasted like, what that success. That success is worth so much. Well, I will forget it, but you guys try and remember this. That, that success is worth any possible sacrifice you can make. But moving on, you might ask yourself, how do we motivate ourselves to keep on going? So we all want to go back to Rio, the next Olympics, and try and get the next medal that we, we feel we deserve. But how do we keep on doing it? You know, how do we train at early in the morning? How do we scar ourselves with these great breads and rice? It's like I need that stuff. Uh, where do we find the motivation to keep on doing that? Well, everyone motivates themselves differently, but we as the track and we've we figured out these three ways to help us maintain our motivation, and you guys can, you can steal this from us if you want. Firstly, you got to set goals. Before London, my number one goal was to become an Olympian. And that kept me motivated on the rainy days, and even when I was tired and sick, I kept on saying I want to be an Olympian. That was my goal. So that's the first of the three things you got to do to keep motivated. Number two is your goals have to be just outside your comfort zone. You know, you can't set a goal and say, okay, I got my goal. It's just got to be a little bit further to make it work just a little bit harder. My new goal is going to be to go back to Rio, the next Olympics, and get a medal. Now that's possible, but it's by no way an easy, easy goal. So it's just outside my comfort range. And lastly, like Nike says, you know, just, just do it. You know, there's no secret. You know, set your goals, make sure they're just outside your comfort range, and then just do it. That's, that's the simplest way to, to do whatever you want to do. So that's me pretty much done. But just to wrap up, touch on the points I talked about. The important thing about you guys doing the sport you do in elementary, elementary and high school, that killer instinct, that thing that separates gold from the old sore ends, is that drive to always want to improve yourself. You know, I can be better, I can get a personal best, I can be a VP, I can, I can figure out how to, how to make that three-point shot, whatever it is, that drive to always want more and more and never settle for mediocrity. It starts here, and that's a good thing. Stress management, self-control, to be able to calm yourself when you're nervous, I mean, even public speaking, I use the same tricks I use when I'm racing, to calm myself home before I talk to a room full of people. That starts with me too, so I can't pack yourself in the back. Motivation, three rules of motivation. Goals, make sure your goals are just outside your comfort range, and then just do it. So that's me done. If there's any questions, I don't know how much time we've got, but we got one or two questions, I'm going to answer some questions. So, uh, yeah. Uh, what was your time? Uh, in London? Yeah. We ran in the final. Uh, it's going to be a DQ now, but I think we ran 38.04, which is the fastest time run by a Canadian team since Don Bailey ran it in 1999. So it was, uh, we were pretty happy about that. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, well, in the relay, uh, in that race, the Jamaicans, we ran 38.04, and the Jamaicans ran 36.84, which, um, just to people, these numbers mean nothing to some people, usually in the 4x1, if you can run under 39 seconds, so 38 anything, you're a top class team. If you can run 37 seconds, you're a world class team, and you will most likely get a medal at every world champs Olympics. 
If you run it in 37 seconds, then you're just playing video games, which is what the Jamaicans are obviously doing. That's, 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 that's a ridiculous, ridiculous time. So 36 seconds is an equal record, and it is ridiculous. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah? What were you thinking when you were running that second leg? Um, well, that's actually that's a very good question. When you're in that kind of situation, a lot of thoughts come into your head. You know, like, oh man, I don't want to drop a stick. I don't want to run slow. What's my mom going to think? What's my coach going to think? You know, you know, what am I going to have to do tonight? All these things come into your head. So we're told, our sports sites tell us that to keep all these other thoughts out of your head, you've got to focus on a few things that have to do with your race, your running. So when I was running that back straight, my coach had told me the night before, make sure your elbow is going as far back as possible. Because I kind of block my elbow when I run. So he says, focus on making sure your elbow goes way, way back so you can finish your stride. And that's what I was thinking of. Elbow back, elbow back, elbow back. And that kept everything else out of my head, and I was focusing on that a little. Uh, two more questions? Yeah? Why do you think the Jamaicans are number one? Is it genetics? Do you think it's um, because they come from such a poor country that they're just so focused on? Yeah, well, people have different reasons for that. Genetics is one, genetics is one thing. Uh, I believe, personally, that the Jamaicans are less comfortable than a lot of the other countries. And when I say less comfortable, a lot of those guys do athletics to sort of get out of the living conditions that they're in now. And, and for me last year, I wasn't on any cardio. Like, I wasn't getting any money from other Canada. And I just, I, I had moved here from Ottawa, and I had just, like, a, a handful of money in my bank account, and every day went lower and lower and lower. So I knew that if I wanted to get any more money, I had to run fast, and then I had the best year of my life. That kind of incentive, it might, just, it might not just, just be money, but that incentive to really, if I don't do this, then I'm going to be in big trouble. That really, really helps. And, I mean, this year now, I am credited, and even though I try and stay focused, there are days when I'm like, oh, well, you know, I'll do it tomorrow, which is a terrible, terrible thing. But had it been last year, I would never have said that. So I think one among many things that make the Jamaicans so successful is that their mindset and how they approach every day, they treat it like, if I don't give 110% today, and if I don't go to sleep knowing that I can have done any more today, then I'm going to be in big, big trouble tomorrow. That's, it's, that, it's that mindset that keeps them on top. You know, they give 110% all the time, whereas a lot of us here, we're comfortable. You know, oh, well, if I don't make the Olympic Games, I'll just I'll go work you know, for Antenna, you know, make a couple of ADK a year, but it's, it's going to be okay. But it's not always the same case for some other people. So that's, that's my reason. That's what I think. Last question? Maybe a big one. <laughs> Pressure. Okay, well, I guess um, those are all the questions. Thank you very much. Um,